Good afternoon uh, and good day, good evening, wherever you are. Welcome, everyone, uh, to the participants joining us online, as well as the members of the audience watching this live stream on Facebook. And this is today's edition of the Centre for International Law Climate Conversations. Our session today will focus on the landscape, the potential, the challenges, as well as the future of carbon capture, utilisation and storage technology in the global efforts to reduce carbon emissions and to address the adverse impact of climate change. This is a, a live session, so please do use, uh, do use the Q&A function, uh, Q &A function uh, to send in your questions uh, in tandem with our discussions. We will also set aside some time in this one hour, video, uh, one hour session for a live Q&A later. Now, it is today uh, with my immense pleasure to introduce our special guest, uh, Ms. Ruth Herbert, who is the Chief Executive Officer of the Carbon, uh, Carbon Capture and Storage Association. CCSA. Sorry. Hi, Danielle. Can you hear me? Yeah, hi. Yes. Hello, Ruth. It's great to Welcome. be with you today. Thank you yeah, for let inviting me, me. Not at all. Let me introduce Ruth. Ruth joined the CCSA in October 2021, following a public sector career spanning almost two decades. The CCSA is a trade association that promotes the commercial deployment of uh, carbon capture, utilization, and storage technology. Its members span the spectrum of the industry from oil and gas to equipment manufacturing to distribution to academia to regional bodies as well as the support services such as uh, law and banking, insurance, consultancy and so on and so forth. So in her previous role as a director of strategy and development at the Low Carbon Contracts Company, Ruth oversaw the implementation of two key features of the UK electricity market. There's a contract for difference and capacity market. The company's development uh, then developed into a trusted advisor to the UK government on decarbonisation. After the UK Department of Energy and Climate uh, Change, Ruth headed the Electricity Market Reform Programme Office, overseeing the delivery of the White Paper and a key Energy Act of 2013. Uh, following her negotiation to the EU Directive on Carbon uh, CO2 Storage, Ruth then led the international uh, CCS policy, as well as the London Ministerial Carbon Sequestration Leadership Forum. She was also a financial services strategy advisor at Her Majesty's Treasury and an economic advisor for the City of London. Indeed, uh, you know, very impressive and very well placed, uh, Ruth, to reflect on the various multiple perspectives surrounding uh, CCUS. So it's, it's really a great pleasure to have you today. Now to start off, let's let's turn to the latest IPCC Working Group 3 report, Climate Change 2022, Mitigation of Climate Change. Now this report reaffirms the significant role of carbon capture and storage technology in limiting global warming. And according to the IPCC, mitigating the worst effects of climate change relies on two overarching strategies. The first is to prevent as much greenhouse gas emissions as possible from reaching the atmosphere. So those solutions, I believe, would include things like carbon capture. And the second is actually to remove CO2 that's already in the atmosphere. So that would include CO2 removal uh, okay. in layman terms. So in light of this report, I think this is carbon capture and storage is really likely to feature significantly in the upcoming COP discussions in November. So let's start with those. Now, among the IPCC report rules, among the 97 assessed pathways, to keep global warming below 1.5, there's a broad range of possible deployment levels for CCS. The IPCC found that the net zero energy systems entail a substantial reduction in overall fossil fuel use, minimal use of unabated fossil fuels, and the use of CCS in the remaining fossil system. The report also identifies something like seven specific pathways which summarize different carbonization strategies, but only one of these includes, does not include, uh, uh, does not, or rather includes no carbon capture, if I could put it in another way. So it seems to be only available, but however, or at least expensive to decarbonize hard to abate sectors such as cement and steel, for which there are really few alternatives. Um, in addition, the IPCC report talks about the world storage basins. It's been assessed, it's been well assessed, and with most high emitting nations demonstrating storage potential, uh, as well as the geological CO2 storage capacity has been more than enough right, 
to limit global warming. So with all these you know, reports and all these uh, findings from, from very, very authoritative, influential IPCC, I wonder you know, from your perspectives, how is this in significant in terms of future deployment and its potential in the use uh, of this technology in climate mitigation in, in achieving net zero? Do you foresee this featuring a lot in the discussions? Um, happy to hear your views on that. Yes. Um, so, yeah, I, I think you've point, you made some really good points there, Danielle. Um, I think for me, when I, you know, read the, the IPCC report, um, this, the overwhelming sort of impression is, is one of, of urgency and pace just being really, really important here. So TCUS is just one of, of many technologies and ad adaptations and things that we need to do, uh, mitigations and, uh, and adaptations and things that need to be done. And the, the need for pace is so apparent, the need to start reducing emissions, uh, you know, emissions peaking by the middle of this, you know, by 2025 and re having to reduce uh, thereafter. That That's just, I think, a lot sooner than people you know, people were assuming in, in previous scenarios and things like that. Um, also, they really made the key point that the, the pathways, yes, there are different pathways, but actually lower, if we have lower emissions in 2030 and we choose that pathway, that has a higher chance of keeping peak warming to 1.5 degrees. So I think the, the sort of, I think that the time for sitting and pondering which is the best route probably isn't isn't the best thing and that we need to just progress as much activity and mitigation activity as we can with with all of all of these technologies in parallel i think there isn't you know this is not a sequential set of mm. actions this is in a need to deploy everything now and, and ccus is clearly part of that that suite of, of mitigation options um so i think i think what we've identified in the in the UK, looking in the UK, was a, a huge pipeline, 70 million tonnes of emissions from power industry uh, that, and uh, blue hydrogen production that could all be uh, uh, captured and stored by 2030. Now, the UK government is aiming for 20 to 30 million tonnes by 2030. And at the point that we've been trying to make is actually, you know, doing more sooner is 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 really important because taking that co2 out of the atmosphere before 2030 has such a bigger impact on the longer term efforts that you you know the efforts that you make later and it's more costly to do it later so i think but also just in terms of the cost the the societal cost of of, of a ton of carbon uh is is will be rising uh you know into into the 2030s and beyond and and we really need to, to to look at that and and consider whether we can bring stuff forward so i think the ipcc report was really crucial in terms of showing how early action is really really necessary um and and i think really within that um as you say there's plenty of potential to do ccus not all uh emissions are close to uh potential carbon sinks, the geological storage sites. However, there are options for transporting CO2 um, by, by road, rail, ship, uh, to places where it can be stored. There are also uh, you know, lo lots of opportunities to um, <coughs> temporarily store it and then, and, and, and then, as I say, transport it to, to geological storage sites. Um, other people are also looking at um, things, some of our members are looking at things like um, carbonates, creating uh, CO2, we call it use, but uh, what we effectively mean is uh, a permanent uh, form of, of CO2 in, into carbonates and things used for building materials yeah. and things like that. Yeah. Now that will yeah. only be a very small proportion, but I think um, it can be uh, a useful contribution as well, but that will be fairly small, I think, um, compared to the geological storage. When I mean, the IEA said so we needed to sort of store about over 7 billion tonnes a year by 2050, so that's that's a lot of CCUS. Um, but I think, you know, that, that there, is the, there is potentially the geology to do that. 
and we have the technology. So I, th I think it's just the IPC report for me really just highlighted the need to, to get going with this, to start doing it as much as we can before 2030 will really help with keeping below 1.5 degrees. And then, you know, beyond that, as you said, carbon dioxide removals will be important. They will be uh, complementary to uh, uh, abatement yeah. is, is direct removals from the atmosphere. And, and that's likely to be needed. Some of the scenarios relied more on that than others. And I think, you know, uh, but but it's very clear that we need quite a bit of CDR as well. So, um, you know, we've got members developing that technology. We're starting to see. Um, uh, so I think it's really, really important because uh, if we are to scale up CDR to the levels that we think we might need, and if I've learned anything in watching the IPC reports, PCC reports year after year, it's that, you know, we always need to do more than we think and we always need to go faster than we think because we're learning all the time with the climate data and we're almost driving looking through the rear view mirror. So it's it's having having that awareness that we probably do need to scale that up quite considerably mm. in the 2030s. And if we're going to be able to do that, deploying it before 2030 so that we can actually get the learnings and uh, enough to scale that up to bigger and bigger facilities. So uh, overall message, I think, is we need pace. Um, CCUS, as you say, is the only way to tackle uh, emissions from uh, certain processes. Uh, right. uh, and and use, use, use of furnaces is, is, is you yeah. know, you can electrify some things, but you're still going to have some emissions. Um, you can um, switch to hydrogen but you are still going to have some emissions from, from things that are, are from the processes involved, chemical processes and things that are, are done. So effectively, you're going to have to fit, fit some carbon capture anyway for a lot of this uh, cement production and so forth. So essentially, I guess the choice then becomes a sort of economic one. You talked about cost. It's, it's you know, if you're going to build a totally new plant, then you might build it in a way that means you need less carbon capture, but you'll still need some. Um, a lot of plants that are, you know, have many years of, of life, uh, I think carbon capture, uh, transport storage is going to be the best uh, solution for them. And it's mm. the solution that we have now. So I think- Can I, uh, can I yeah. come in on that, Ruth? Thanks very much. Yeah. I, I think I think you've made a key point, which is that uh, from the IPCC report, we need, urgent action and that's a common that's a constant reframe and we need to do more now i wanted to come back to the question on um, the potential situation and definitely there's a lot of potential a lot of a number of countries have referred to use of ccs technology in their ndcs as well as part of climate yes. mitigation but at the same time and i think there's been also some questions whether the potential is overblown whether whether technology is already is, is at a mature state enough to be scaled up or, or is still developing as you mentioned um, and since I think way back in 2013 had had released a set of criticisms about it, things like, you know, is it is it is, is there an incomplete knowledge? Mind you, this was in 2013. We're like more than 10 years now, right? So uh, incomplete knowledge, false sense of security, precautionary, lack of you know, uncertainties. I wonder you know, how would you respond to that concern and how 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 is those those concerns about transparency and, and reliability actually um can be addressed, or, or is it, you know, the state technology is, is already fairly mature in your view to be deployed at wide scale? Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Danielle. Really good question. Um, so all of the technologies involved in, in carbon capture and storage are, are fully, are, are fully uh, understood. They've been operating for many decades in sectors of the economy that already exist. So uh, the capture processes are already used for, for decades in the chemicals industry. So they're really well mm. understood. Um, obviously mm. there's second generation geez, there's there's taking processes that have been used in the chemical sector and making them more effective so that they capture more CO2 uh, mm. and so that they do so more efficiently and with less right. environmental impact. So yes, there's, there's, there's refinement of them for the purpose of capturing CO2 um, right. uh, for, for mitigation purposes, but, but these technologies have been around for decades in the chemicals industry. Right. And in, and in fact, industry. in some okay. cases, in some cases, people are already 
uh, removing CO2 or, or, or emitting pure streams of CO2, which all you would need to yeah. do is put a pipe on the end and, and get it stored. Right. So again, the, the knowledge about transporting CO2 by pipeline is, is, is well known because mm -hmm. uh, there is lots of CO2 uh, pipelines in use already uh, uh, around the world. Mainly they're there because it's being used in enhanced oil recovery. But mm. uh, the, the point is that the, the process knowledge and the operational knowledge is is there in, in the sector. Mm. Um, so, mm. you know, that that is that is not an unknown. Um, mm. And then uh, equally, there's there's experience in transporting CO2 by ships because it is actually a commodity that is transported as well already. Uh, and then when you look at storage, um, Again, um, we have, thanks to uh, the Sleipner site in Norway, in the public domain, I think over 20 years of data about how CO2 has behaved uh, in the saline aquifer there. Um, and mm. at the time that project was started, um, you know, there was concern that because of a large amount of the storage will be in saline aquifers as well as depleted oil and gas fields and there was concern that maybe you know how well will it will it work in the saline aquifer well we now have 25 years of public data showing that that it works really really well so i think that's given people a huge amount of confidence and in the uk one of the stores that is moving forward in the first wave is it is a saline aquifer um, and very much building on on all that knowledge that has has been put in the public domain by by Norwegian government. So, right. uh, and you, you, they've also got, um, as I said, depleted oil and gas fields. And there, of course, I've, I've talked about enhanced oil recovery has been done. So, understand how CO two behaves in those in those fields. And I think really what you've got to to realise is it's it's quite hard to get something out once it's gone into one of those those um storage formations because mm. uh yeah the only way to get it out is to try to force it out by it with a lot of applying a lot of pressure so the, these are effectively like sponges that soak up the co2 it's nature mm. it's where nature has stored co2 for for mm. uh, millions of years and it is therefore the, the safest place to put it um right you pointed out you know transparency transparency is really important with all of this transparent data about what's happening with the CO2s, CO2 underground, monitoring, reporting, independent regulator that ensures mm. that the CO2 is, is where it should be, um, is yeah. really, really important for this technology. And it's actually what enables, I think, CCS to sort of have a, a gold standard really around the permanence of this stored CO2, right. which I think is so important for climate. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm very confident that, you know, all of this can be put together. Um, we have uh, lots and lots of members working on projects around the world that, uh, you know, doing all the detailed engineering for this. And I think, you yeah. know, we, we just need to get on and deliver it now. We've used these technologies for other purposes. Now let's use them to, to tackle climate change. Yeah. No, thank you, Ruth. I think it's a good segue to two, 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 two issues. One um, is actually the question of deployment. And second is the question of regulatory landscape, which you mentioned. So maybe yes. I'll just uh, uh, raise both at the same time maybe, so it can be addressed. Um, so you mentioned you know, it's been longstanding use in Norway. Um, and I was just looking at some information on the rates of deployment globally and, of course, in the Asian region. Um, and IPCC actually went on to say that the global rates of deployment are actually far below those necessary, in fact, to reach uh, that that uh, the pathway. Um, there were some reports, and I'm sure you have other data, but you know, out of 27 operationally uh, commercial projects worldwide, 21 use CO2 for what you call enhanced oil recovery. But I wonder if you could share a little bit more from your perspective in terms of the deployment rates, say between Europe, Asia, uh, it is part of the world, Southeast Asia, what is, you know, even without the specific data, you know, sort of a trend and are there any particular reasons for, for that trend that you see? Uh, from what I can see, it's the highest take up so far is in the US and, and Western Europe, uh, and then perhaps in a little slower scale or rather a, a lower scale, China, Japan, Australia, uh, Middle East and Southeast Asia. But uh, if, if you have information on that, that'd be great. And the, the second list of questions I'm quite keen on is, is really the, the regulatory landscape. Um, 
for, for, sure. this, for this CCS to, to you know what, what is actually the regulatory landscape? I mean, there's a European directive, uh, but it seems to be a, a bit of a patchwork, uh, a bit of a gap. So, particularly when it comes to transboundary projects, which will be quite important in areas which are you know, where, where countries are in close geographical proximity, um, where there are shared aquifers that, that cross the boundaries. Um, when it comes to countries that may not have, uh, there may be more landlocked and therefore need to you know, trans transport their you know, CO2 um, elsewhere. What really is the regulatory landscape like? I think that would be quite uh, important for, for, for any policy makers to be, to be aware of. Yeah, thanks. Um, so uh, first question I think was about um, current deployment I suppose and yeah. as you as you rightly point out some of these some of the early projects have been a sort of small scale but they're attached to kind of other kind of operations and so they are I guess piloting technology for different purposes alongside uh, normal business I guess for, for some of these companies and and so yeah I think I think we need to to take into account that um, in terms of kind of large scale projects that are purely uh, uh, that are capturing, you know, the full emissions from from a facility and and, and transporting and store it, storing it, there are there are you know very few of those at the moment. But I mean, the, the mm. global CCS uh, Institute is is quite a good source of information, as well as many others. I know that you you're aware of, um, and and they've you know they kind of have a, a, a standard that they apply to kind of assess projects which I think was based on the IEA's original um, sort of methodology back, back in the 2000s uh, uh, when they were doing those reports on the global status of CCS. So the GCCSI report most recent one last year said you know it showed that there were kind of 136 projects in development globally and I think what was most interesting rather than the number was the kind of trend. So the scale of projects between since the 1970s, which was when the first pilots were being done through to the kind of 2020s is the, the, the projects are getting bigger and they're actually right. now focusing more on heavy and in, heavy industry emissions. Right. So rather than previous, you know, previously these just being and gas sector they are now being demonstrated and they're getting bigger and being demonstrated on different sectors of the economy so it shows ccus's ability to be relevant to quite a few sectors of the economy chemicals and cement and and, and so forth and refining mm. so i think i think i think that's that's the trend um in terms of kind of the split between sort of europe and asia and so forth um I mean, there are about sort of in the UK, we're doing clusters. There are about six or seven clusters that are emerging with with two going forward in the in the first government track one phase. Um, but there are the, the zero emissions. Uh, as I said, we've identified kind of 70 million tons worth of emissions in the in the UK. Uh, our Brussels office uh, runs the uh, zero emissions uh, platform secretariat and the zero emissions platform in the EU has identified over 50 projects that are ready to be developed uh, across right. the EU. I think, you know, the Port of Rotterdam is a cluster that's moving forward very quickly as well of the UK. So, and obviously we've talked about Norway, there's Iceland as well. There's, so there's quite a few kind of, I, I would say, leaders in that, that region. Right. Um, but I think uh, according to GCCSI, there's sort of 14 significant facilities across Asia specific, Pacific out of the sort of 136 global ones. So I think you can see there, there's a, you know, compared to maybe perhaps, you know, the, the potential for CCUS in that region, really, I think the, the kind of development pipeline of, of significant projects is still quite small. So it's a really good, a good thing yeah. to focus on because I think, yeah. as you said, it, I've, I've noticed that really big drivers for thinking about this, especially how this is going to be relevant in COP27, the NDCs. So once a country has a net zero target, it almost doesn't matter 
what the date is, of course, we want the date to be 2050, but once they have a target, even if, say, the date is 2070, mm -hmm. for example, or mm -hmm. whatever, once they have that target, their NDC then needs their economy and set out a plan. And mm -hmm. that's when you start to see that CCS pops up in quite a few parts of that plan mm -hmm. because it's needed to get to totally net zero power generation mm -hmm. and you need... Yeah. Uh, you need your electricity decarbonized if you are then yeah. to decarbonize other sectors. So you need yeah. power CCUS. And then uh, you also need um, uh, CCUS for hydrogen production. You also need CCUS for heavy industry. So it starts to then feature in, in different parts of plans. So I think when we start to see that, which is, is starting, but I think now people are redoing their NDCs. I think yeah. those that have at zero targets that will become more apparent and at that point i think that's when you yeah talk about regulatory environment and what is needed to make those projects yeah. happen i'm i'm curious because i think also bearing in mind the the, the mix of um participants uh, you know it's a mix of government officials technology and count and uh, regulators on this on this call um for countries in in asia or maybe for countries that haven't quite yet fully embarked on this process I'm curious about the enabling drivers. What are the enabling drivers for deployment? Uh, whether you're looking at the leak or, or should or put it in another way, what are the enabling drivers and what are the obstacles to the yeah. take up? You know, uh, yeah. are they policy generally? Are they legislative, regulatory? Um, and in particular, I think when one thinks about, I'm particularly curious about transboundary take uh, CCS projects. Um, you know. Are there particular challenges to that? And, and then that, I think, will segue to the next set of questions which I'm quite keen yeah. on exploring, which is the right. international legal framework and how it sits yeah. with existing public international law, say, or uh, UNCLOS, or Law of the Sea, or Marine Environment Protection. Uh, but maybe let's just deal with the uh, policy yeah. or the political economic uh, conditions first, the drivers for that, and, and particularly in relation to Definitely. transboundary projects. Yeah. I think I think the barriers are are economic and political. I don't I don't think they're technological as as I described before. And I think uh, so. One of the key things is uh, who pays the cost of uh, the additional cost of operating a facility with the carbon capture uh, and uh, the cost of the the transport and storage network. And so there are different options for that um, in, and different countries are approaching that in different ways but it's it's very very clear that there needs to be support to facilities that want to decarbonize uh, especially if there isn't uh, a carbon price that will support uh, and make that economic uh, in and of itself I mean it's really really clear uh, the IPCC said you know the high price of emissions needs to be reflected in policies we haven't got that at the moment um, where there are carbon markets regionally, um, prices are starting to rise to those levels, I think, within, within Europe. But uh, um, still, there is a lack of business confidence, I think, in those prices and a, a lack of trust that politicians won't decide this is all costing too much. Let's, let's <laughs> you know, mm. uh, allow people to emit more. And that would drive, obviously, the price down. So I think, I think, that it's not really that investable at the moment on the carbon price alone. And that's what we've seen in the UK. And we, the government has recognised this. Uh, develop business models uh, and contracts for difference to sort of uh, provide the difference between the carbon price and the cost of capturing um, CO2 for different facilities to, to make sure that um, this can be this can be covered. So I think that's really, really important. The other thing, and we talked about it already, but I think it's just really important to have a, a regulator who is independently uh, uh, approving the storage plans and assessing that they are being carried out properly. I think that's really, really important. So you talked about the directive on CO2 storage. That was one that I negotiated from the UK government side when we were in the EU back in 2000. Um, seven, eight, and um, that was really, really crucial because what that did was set a standard for how CO2 storage site was would be you would be planned, used, operated and, and monitored at the end as well. Uh, um, and that that has created a sort of standard really for CO2 storage in Europe, 
which you know the UK still follows obviously as um, even in post EU exit so that is a really important uh, piece of legislation and I think that's something that could be transferred across to other regions that have uh, and, and I think this is where where you've already got a regulator in the offshore industry if you already have an offshore industry say you have a oil and gas industry offshore in, in your country then mm. you will already have a regulator for that but that regulator has got to get skilled in uh, uh look understanding co2 storage right and and, and being right. able to oversee that independently and make sure that that's done properly and make sure that's reported and is transparent as you say and that's really crucial because only mm. if that is done properly then can you get the credits and say that's not been emitted um but as i say providing it's put in <laughs> correctly it's very difficult to get it out but i still think you know you do need to have that reg so that you can prove you can monitor you actually meet to the amount of co2 that goes in so you know exactly mm. how much has gone in and then you monitor it with different techniques to make sure it stays there and the regulator must be able to independently validate that so i think it's about upskilling regulators it's about putting this legislation in place obviously giving them the powers to do this um if there isn't an offshore regulator or there isn't that already then obviously that all, all has to be created as I say, some people might have saline aquifers, but if they don't have domestic industry, there might not be the confidence within the, the legal system mm -hmm. as to how to legislate that. But I think there are really good lessons from, from Europe on that. Um, and then cross-border. Um, so with, with cross-border, I think um, we yet to see that even in Europe, but there are there are um, projects looking at that. I think one of the big advantages for say an area like the North Sea Basin, um, but there are similar basins and areas that are shared. Obviously, uh, you, you're sitting in one, I think. So, um, but there are you know there are there are other areas like that where um, potentially uh, storage resilience can be achieved by having. Uh, multiple stores um, that are linked together um, which you know and having more of a, a sort of net network there may even be transboundary stores that start in one one country's territory and and, and finish in another I think all of these uh, things have been looked at from a from a legal perspective by different by different groups of people um, and what we we see is that um, for example, the the cross border CO two that's the the London Protocol has has been particularly yeah. important. So the London Protocol to the Ospar Convention, where uh, set out the circumstances in which CO two can be transferred across border, and uh, there was a, a recent decision which means if uh, a party ratifies that. If two parties ratify that, then they can transfer between each other and they don't have to wait for everybody to ratify yeah. Uh, yeah. the whole protocol. So that's been really helpful. I think that will allow some people to, to move forward uh, with that. And I think once it's been done in one place, I think it's easier sometimes for, for others to copy that approach. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, you're right. There's quite, you know, there's quite a few... I think regulatory things that need to happen so you know we also are in discussion about how do you make sure that if you've emitted CO2 in one country and you've transported it to another country and they've stored it under their regulatory yeah. system how do you yeah. ensure that that counts under your own emissions trading system yeah. which might be a completely yeah. different system and this is where I come back to the the directive and the the standard for geological storage because if that becomes a standard that can be kind of assessed independently in a global standard mm -hmm. then I think that will go a huge way to enabling that that kind of project yeah so that 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 was the point I was curious about because I, I was just reading in at least in Southeast Asia you know, commercial facilities have been announced in 2021 Petronas in Sarawak uh, in Malaysia, uh, with two potential regional offshore hubs in Malaysia, uh, Repsol in Sumatra have announced plans as well. Um, you know, uh, Singapore um, Tamasic has also invested in a Canadian company that looks at this. I'm just curious because you know, is it is it going to be? I would say maybe from a commercial operator point of view, and also bearing in mind the background of of what you mentioned, that are using and tying it back to the Paris Agreement uh, in terms of the emissions. Uh, 
NDCs and possibly even Article 6, the, 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 the carbon yes. uh, trading market. Um, how important would it be for there to be some sort of a harmonization um, of rules or regulations, particularly when, as you say, there's, there's bound to be some cross-boundary element. How important is that um, uh, it, from, from the commercial perspective for the investors, for the companies, to be prepared to go into this to this region, and I, I guess one question I had also: Are there unresolved legal issues even within Europe on questions like legal liability, um, and, and questions of insurance, um, liability when uh, the storage facility is closed, for example? Um, what are the un uh, un questions yes. that are still being discussed with, with some amount of contention, uh, sure. whether in Europe or in US? Yeah, yeah. No, I, th I think you're right. I think, a st you know, a standard geological stored carbon is, is very important. Um, I think, uh, I think also Article 6 uh, has set now a, a framework for, for trading internationally, which I think is really, really important and will enable these kind of projects to to actually move forward and, and access that 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 uh, funding in, in a way through through credits, but I think I still think that um, in and of itself that's not going to dr drive the projects. I mean, we'll, we'll come back to it. You know, it will be an important framework for driving action across all technologies. But I think what is more I suppose urgently driving um, a lot of a lot of projects is is the is the you know is going to be the is going to be the national targets at the end of the day and so I think right. and, and that's where you see that I think national governments are going to have to find a way to advise this and um, yes hopefully Article Six gives them access to, to finance and things but in the short term I think there's going to need to be to be other ways as well because that framework will take some time to work and some projects are getting away maybe earlier with some help from the voluntary market as well i think that could be a great source of finance um but i, I think standards are really important here uh, and transparency around storage um so uh, i think that storage standard is still required required in the voluntary market as well eventually i think this is what people are going to want so um, I, I don't think you'd be waste, wasting effort working on that uh, at wherever, whatever jurisdiction right. you're in. I think that's that's the key to a lot of this. Um, yeah, and you sort of said, "Oh, are, they, are these projects going to going to happen in time?" And I, th I think I think the important well, I think the important thing is so with the storage site. Obviously, you know, for example, in the CCS directive in Europe, what happens is the operator is responsible for the storage site for the duration of time that they're injecting CO2. And then after they've finished injecting CO2 for another 20 years, they have mm. to uh, maintain, may, make sure that they are monitoring and that nothing is has changed in the site. Um, okay. After that point, it becomes the responsibility of, of the government. So right. that is something that I think governments are going to have to to sort of uh, accept that that there is a kind of need for uh, that because that will in it that enables you know insurance products to come forward. It enables companies to understand you know the the limitations of their liabilities mm. so that they right. can uh, you know finance and uh, and understand their, their their responsibilities. So that's been quite a key uh, part of the legislation. I think that's going to have to be similar in most jurisdictions um but yeah i think yeah i think i think you're right i think the the sort of i think the car a regional or local carbon market or price of carbon will obviously help drive some of the cheaper cheaper mm -hmm. projects um i said that, you know i talked about some of the kind of gas processing or some of the the industrial kind of uh processes that might be just em emitting quite a pure stream of CO2, it might be quite cheap to capture that. Uh, mm -hmm. Transport and storage could be coming down in, you know, in price there if they're very close to kind of maybe a store or something. So there might be particular projects that, you know, a, a good 
uh, carbon price could could drive uh, 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 economically. But I think in the first instance, it's likely to need, as I said, you know, government support of some kind, yeah. especially yeah. if there isn't a car, especially if there isn't a carbon price. Yeah. Um, some some com- some countries have put CO two taxes offshore. That's what Norway has done, for example. That's what drove the Sleipner project in Norway right. initially. Sure. So I think there are there are options here that that, that countries can consider. Mm. Uh, I was just reading um, on, on some of these issues, I, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I, mean, I was just wondering what are, as you said, we talked about the regulatory issues for large scale projects that does need to be resolved by any regulator, by any policy. I mean, they're, they're talking about the issues like jurisdiction, classification of the of the CO2 itself, even property rights, right? Because then you know, of course was probably whose land so on contractual and liability, we talked about licensing, we talked about monitoring, you talked about monitoring as well, and relationship with existing regulations and financial issues we talked about as commercial for solutions. So it's quite a, 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 a quite a range of considerations uh, which are both a policy and and the legal component from what I can see. And even from the legal common, and then brings us to what we call the harmonization. I won't use the word harmonization, but at least some, some consistency, some alignment, uh, really to avoid sort of a regulatory arbitration, really for, for certainty, I would imagine, for, for the operators. And that's quite, quite important. So that, that's a very um, uh, useful, um, I would say, survey of the, the, the questions, or, or, or rather the considerations that I, I was very curious about. Um, and, and I think, as you have pointed out, uh, uh, these have been addressed in uh, some shape or form in the EU directive. And I looked at it really because it was about the very comprehensive one that I could find. And I know the US Biden administration is, is looking to putting up some regulations as well. So that will be another very interesting uh, development to watch. Um, you know. But but what, what I found, uh, I think, important for any, uh, and I'm looking at it also from the climate perspective, from an international environmental law perspective. and. You know, Ocean's perspective, you know, we have to look at things like risk to environment and health, and how is that going to be factored in the EIAs, for example. We need to look at um, the security. To, uh, you mentioned transport transport network. You know, how is it transported safely and securely, um, and then looking at whether there are any barriers in existing regimes. So that's that's a, a, a very very key consideration. Yeah, I think on on um, that, you know, um, planning is quite key as well. Here, this is this is strategic infrastructure. Uh, yeah. decarbonisation uh, infrastructure. Yeah. Good point. So yeah, that's a good point. Can that yeah. be sped up? Because in some countries, the planning to get permission for p- new pipelines, new facilities can be quite slow. So um, that that is a challenge given it, the that's true. The pace. That that's we, true. Yeah, and even these projects to take what well, generally about seven years to set up. It's not something you can set up overnight. The major major infrastructure projects. Yeah, I think I think on the lead in times actually the. Some of the storage sites, like saline aquifers, they can take many, many years to appraise, to understand. Mm. So they need to be right. wells drilled and ex- a- appraisal of the site, test injections and things. So there is, I think, many years of lead in time for these storage sites. So yeah. um, even if okay. a country is not thinking it will need much, much CCS before 2030, if they haven't mm-hmm. already started to appraise storage sites, they need to get started now, um, because okay. otherwise they, <laughs> they won't be there when they need yeah, them. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, but that, that's true. Um, I, I, I was wondering also, maybe just seeking your views on this, and particularly since you're working very closely, uh, both government um, back, background and also now with industry, uh, and, and and I'm coming really more from clarity on the international law regime. And this was also a question that um, you know, participants, one of the participants has actually sent in before. Um, I've tried to weave in those questions I've sent before in our conversation today. And one of the questions was you know, whether there's, you know, there any clarity, is, is the state of international law sufficiently clear on various aspects of CCS technology? Uh, do, they in, do they present obstacles or barriers because there's some ambiguity um, in terms of how the technology applies. So let me give an example. I, need, I think you mentioned the London Protocol. Um, and then I could also refer to UNCLOS uh, as well in Basel Convention in terms of you know, whether or not CO2 is, is you know, injection into the seabed is considered a form of pollution, whether the transport is considered a form of transport of hazardous material. Um, and even under the London Convention, London Protocol, you, you talked about the amendments as well. 
which was um, necessary in a way to make it clear the countries could actually start storing CO2 in subsea geological formations. Um, so I'm curious really from, from, from your view or rather from, your industry, from the industry's view and from your background, more importantly, do they present a obstacle? And what are the unanswered questions? Are they more unanswered questions than those that are kind of you know, alluded to? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think our, our view is that the, the London Protocol uh, amendments um, mean that this this can now be, be done. So I, I think I think what what is I think what is still to be worked through, which is the sort of it's a political and an economic question, really, is you know who takes res who who is taking responsibility for uh, say the long term liability of that CO two. So if you are a receiving country and you happen to have more storage than you need for your domestic emissions and you can offer that decarbonisation service to your neighbouring country, then mm. you can take that CO2 and uh, put it into your, your storage site and that, that will be allowed if both parties uh, have ratified the, the, the yeah. protocol. I think the challenge is that there will still probably need to be an intergovernmental agreement on top of that because presumably you need to be absolutely clear uh, you will want uh, agreement of monitoring and reporting so that the country that has passed its emissions over is able to, to claim the credit for that because they can point to secure storage in the other countries. So they will need the data to be able to validate that and prove that to whatever system is in place there. Uh, mm -hmm. And the receiving country, of course, will, the, the, depending on what scheme the government has put in place around the long term liability for that site. But at mm. some point that will become the government's responsibility um, at some point post operations in the EU. It's 20 years, but it could be different in other jurisdictions. But essentially, at some point that will become effectively the, the long term liability of that government. Now, it's very, very unlikely event that some someone might, without a, uh, without permission, presumably go and spend lots and lots of money to drill a hole in someone else's storage site. <laughs> that's, that's probably the only way that you could get CO2 out. And, and, and since that's very expensive and hard to do, I can't see why anyone would want to try to do that uh, um, and, and, and shouldn't be able to do that without any permission so I, I think these are very these are risks that the government can control and be responsible for with a with a responsible regulator but I think nevertheless it is a residual liability that transfers um, and therefore uh, you know the intergovernmental agreement presumably would state what you know uh, state this and who make clear who's responsible uh, and so forth so and okay. you know there's then, of okay. course, the economic thing of how much do they charge to take the CO2 uh, and so mm. forth, whether they include some kind of provision for that long term liability within that cost or whether it's done just through an international agreement, uh, uh, an right. intergovernment agreement. So I think these are things that they're political and economic. I don't think, you know, they are barriers because they don't exist. But I think writing an agreement there are some agreements being drafted at the moment between North Sea Basin countries that I think maybe are going to be, you know, useful if they can, you know, if they can get that sorted, then maybe they can be used for, for, for others as well. But uh, as you say, it's very interesting to see what others are doing too. Okay, cool. Thanks, thanks very much for that, Ruth. I, I think we've got two questions at this moment in time. Um, so I'd like to move to those questions so that there's an opportunity to address them. Let me just pull them out as well from where I can. Uh, but before we move to those questions, yeah, I mean, I think I was just reminded about the discussions on climate-related geoengineering and the you know, there were proposals on that in the UN um, Environmental uh, uh, Union uh, Assembly in 2019. It was a Swiss proposal on geoengineering governance, actually calling for status assessment and authorised human bodies, uh, uh, you know, uh, quite, quite aligned with what you mentioned about, you know, some, some sort of a common international agreement to, to, for options for governance. But uh, unfortunately, there was, um, there was opposition to that and that was withdrawn. 
Um, but there, there are there have been ongoing the, uh, references to climate related geoengineering, the CBD uh, Convention on Biological Diversity, the COP context. Um, and but it, to me, I think it was a little bit more of a conservative approach. Um, but again, this was based on the science from 2010 and 2012. So a little bit more cautious about the use um, about geo, uh, climate related geoengineering. So let me just move to those those questions, if I may. Uh, there was one question about. Um, interested in your thoughts regarding technology transfer and how to teach, how to treat IP laws, you know, in terms of facilitating the deployment of this uh, technology to Asia and other developing countries. So put it in another way, you know, and the examples of good pra practices and technology sharing on this field. So that's one set of questions. Um, and the other set of question uh, came from uh, somebody called um, Esther, I think, who says the decarbonization itself is insufficient as a motivation for the biggest emitters to embark on CCUS projects. So that seems to be more of a, a comment. Uh, and this is especially when there is, as you say, not much of a commercial business case and or confidence to pursue because of limited demand. So the question here is globally, have you observed how this lack of demand is being addressed other than, you know, uh, look, looking at carbon pricing uh, that you have mentioned? Um, so maybe you could address that first before I move to the, the next question, which seems to be a little bit uh, sort of a different, a different track. Yeah. yeah. So I think I think uh, I talked a bit about it um, uh, earlier. I think there is a kind of a combination of 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 approaches, right? So alongside, Car I said, you know, I don't think carbon pricing is 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 going to be sufficient uh, at this stage, um, mm -hmm. given where it's at uh, and given the cost of the technology. Um, so support measures that top up the carbon price are, I think, necessary in the initial phases of deploying this technology. Certainly until the economies of scale are such that the, the costs are a lot cheaper. Of course, the more CCS you do, the cheaper the transport storage is because the cost is mm -hmm. shared across all, all the users. So I think that's a, a really uh, easy way of getting that cost down. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I think I think there does need to be support to, 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 to build this at scale initial phases. Um, yeah. And so, uh, you know, that's one thing. The other thing, as I said, people are looking at maybe might be taxes, may, other taxes, maybe mandates. But at the end of the day, um, I think that the challenge that we have, if, if you want to try to use punitive measures, is that industry at the moment can just go to a country where they will not face those punitive measures. So I think kind of globally, we don't solve the problem by uh by trying to put in place the, those kind of measures i think uh, mm. i think what is crucial i think is to support industry to make mm. these changes um and then we should start to see things like product standards and demand for cleaner products drive a more come out route for this um in, you know and uh, okay. on the lines, so I think we've a lot of work to, uh, you know, comment on. Uh, there has been a UK government uh, consultation on product standards. There's also work going on in, in the EU and elsewhere. So I think this is this is quite key. Mm. Yeah, mm. because this that, decarbonisation will be a way to differentiate themselves in the market, and there will be desire for those products. We can see that demand is there, but we need a kind of stand a system of standards, as we discussed, to make yeah. sure that. You know, your clean cement really In is confidence, clean. right? Yeah, that's yeah, right. I mean, to avoid the green washing elements yeah. as well, I think. I mean, because yeah. there's a similar, there's somewhat similar question because if I put it in another way, I mean, basically asking how private sector can best be motivated to undertake the projects aside from carbon pricing. But I think you kind of address that as well in, in, in terms yeah. of supportive measures from the government, clear regulatory rules addressing these questions, um, some commonality in the standards and, and also product standards to I suppose to underpin the confidence in the products or in the clean cement yes. or clean CS. Yeah. So it I, must I, be I, life yeah. cycle. It must be life cycle yeah. analysis for this is very important. Um, okay. We, we've been quite concerned about some developments in the EU where uh, uh, maybe uh, hydrogen can be classed as clean if it, if it did, uh, you know, if it was produced using electricity, but you have, have to look at where the electricity has come from and, and whether it is 
fully renewable or, or not. So I think that, uh, or it's fully low carbon or, or not. Mm. So I think things like a low carbon hydrogen standard, for example, are really, really Im important because then, you know, you, you are assessing the life cycle emissions associated with that fuel um, before you're allowed to call it clean. It has to, to meet that standard. Okay. So things like that are really, really important. And I think this is about this is true for all technologies that we need to be looking at the, the, the full life cycle of, of emissions okay. and making Thanks sure that what we say is a clean product really is a clean product. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess that could be set for for many of the other um, activities that are uh, being put forward. It's a little bit like ESG uh, sort of debate with government uh, with among companies that when they say they're green, they, they have to make sure that the entire that they really are green. Um, and, and this is where I see some parallel with, with what we are discussing here. I think the questions, uh, the second question, um, I think we already kind of addressed that earlier in terms of what are the criticisms of, of CCS um, as being, uh, you know, uh, something to prolong the fossil fuel industry. It's just transition, it's transitionary and you know, move away from fossil fuel uh, use for energy demand. I think you've addressed that, but but if you, you we've got just like maybe like two minutes left. So you've already addressed that, but if you have anything more you'd like to add to that, um, yeah, it'll be a, a Yeah, I, 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 I think, um, look, it's, it's not for me to make this point. I think, you know, the leading scientists in this area and the IPCC and also the, the IEA have made it really, really clear that we need this technology. There are things that we cannot decarbonize without CCOS. So I, I think that case has been made by much more uh, highly reputed uh, experts than myself. Um, I, don't, I don't think we should see CCOS as being synonymous with continuing fossil fuels. I think in fact, it's the opposite. It's reverse process engineering extraction. It's, it's putting the CO2 back down into those those uh, formations so it's it's the reverse it has to be the mm. reverse that the, mm. the climate demands that um we i i think where perhaps they get there is a bit of confusion perhaps is around um as i said before in some jurisdictions people are are doing co2 storage but using that co2 to get to get more uh uh, production uh, of fossil mm. fuels. I think again, yeah. that's not that's not CCUS for for mitigation purposes. Um, that's right. That's, that's, that's different, okay. right? So I, I, that's that's been the way that people have have got to understand what's possible with CO two storage in in some places. But that isn't the model for the huge amount of emissions reductions we need under the IPCC report. We we have to be taking huge volumes of CO2 and putting them permanently in yeah. subsea formations or, or deep geological formations and, and leaving them there. And that, that's, that's very, very clear. So I think it's about yeah. definitions. I think there's a lot of confusion because some early projects were also production projects. So yeah. I, I, this is a shame that, that this this continues to be part of the debate, but I think it points to why this permanent storage standard is so important and why independent assessment and transparency and public data on storage is so important. Because when people start to see that this stuff is there and it stayed there, um, I think I think that will, and it will speak for itself and, and you can see that with the Sleipner project. So um, yeah, mm. I mean, it's... I think it is just the symptom of the fact that this has been the oil and gas industry that have these skills and knowledge in the subsurface. Uh, and therefore, you know, they are the ones that need to help uh, solve this, this problem, right? So um, let's make them solve the problem. Not, not, let's not let them off the hook. <laughs> Thanks very much, Ru, for this uh, very, I mean, personally, very educational as well. I mean, uh, for me as well, too, for you know, uh, understanding more demystifying i think uh, uh helped a lot in demystifying what the ccus is all about um addressing some of the more common uh, critique and analysis and suspicion or skepticism even of this process uh but but helping to address that and helping to uh, understand um, and and more importantly understand what the drivers are what the obstacles are and what the enabling factors are and i think that would be important for both the regulators the policy makers and in and, and, and industry who are operating in this, particularly in Asia, where you know, perhaps it's not as advanced, it's just starting. 
And this conversation is so useful, and I, was, you know, certainly for me in understanding the liability issues, how what we need to address, the transport issues, the liability issues, the insurance issues, um, even contractual and IP and property, um, definitely worthy of of another deeper conversation. I think we talked about potentially yes. another really event scratch the surface. I feel that's right. This is just a scratch. Yeah. This is just a teaser. It's just a taster. Um, and I hope we can uh, actually circle around to find some time to actually uh, you know, have have the, a, a more in-depth discussion where we have uh, one element talking legal, one element talking policy and technical. I think that would be wonderful to, to have the conversation uh, as well. So thank you. It leads me to thank you, Ru, for, for, for your time and very generous in sharing your, your background and your knowledge. And also to participants who either on YouTube or, or on our webinar uh, who have been uh, engaging and, and uh, enjoying the conversation and discussion. I'm going to get this 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 with this feedback as well. And I do thank you, uh, Ruth, for your for your contribution to this very interesting conversation. Thank you very much, Ruth. Thank and you, have a good day, everybody. Thank you, Ruth. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Mm -hmm.